the level of detail that you include in your model depends on on the purpose of the model. Um, it depends on are you using it for design or are you using it for analysis? Um, do you need it to be very accurate or do you just need to be in the ballpark, etc. And so here we have um, a DC motor and one example of a of a model is this this graphic here uh, sort of a circuit diagram a free body diagram and then over here we have an equation that that represents um, the motor it may not look look so at, at first glance but um, this model is is simplified um, is, is a simple model or relatively simple model um, and the benefit of it is that it's simple enough that we can we can solve it by hand so we can generate a closed form solution of this or maybe we can't yet but but by the end of this class you will be able to solve this equation and so you know I could say this is the voltage input to the motor and then you could solve this equation for that input and tell me exactly what the equation would be for this for the speed response and so you know, having this closed form solution gives you a lot of intuition. You can look at the solution and see exactly how the different parameters affect the response. How does the resistance affect the response? How does the inertia of the motor affect the response? Um, one, one limitation is that often in order to make the model simple enough to solve, to generate a closed form solution for, uh, you have to make simplifying assumptions and so it might not be as accurate. So let's take a look at this particular example and think about what sort of assumptions were made to uh, to simplify to simplify the model. So one simplifying assumption is that uh, we've sort of lumped the parameters of the model. So if we look at this picture, this figure, we sort of have a, a resistor in series with an inductor. In reality, the the motor itself doesn't doesn't have a, a big in, a resistor inside of it in series with a big inductor. In reality, it has a, a long piece of wire that has properties distributed along the length of the wire. So, you know, the resistance is distributed across the whole wire, the inductance is distri distributed across the whole wire. But instead of modeling it in that way, we've sort of taken the entire property of the piece of wire and lumped it into one resistance and one inductance. Another simplifying assumption that we've made is the friction within the motor. We've modeled it as being as being a linear function of the speed of the motor. And the advantage of that is that linear equations are are easy to solve or easier to solve. In reality, this you know the the friction doesn't exactly behave like that. Um, it may be a function of the um, the the speed of the motor squared or it may have some stiction in it so um, it may initially stick uh, so you'll apply some torque and it won't move at first um, but if you increase the the voltage or the you know the torque being generated it'll eventually break free of the stiction and so that's not captured in this model but adding those nonlinear elements would make it make the equation very difficult to solve Another example of a nonlinearity that that exists in the in the true motor is uh, that it saturates. Um, you know, all physical systems in reality have have some limit to them. This this motor can't generate an infinite speed or an infinite torque. At some point, it's going to saturate. Um, and again, so we've we've left that out of this model. Another example of a simplification is that we've assumed that all of the coefficients are time invariant. Um, we've assumed that the resistance is constant, that the friction is constant. When rea in reality, again, that's not always the case. Um, the resistance may change with the temperature of the motor. It may change um, with the age of the motor. Uh, the friction may change. You know, maybe you have some lubricating oil in there, and as the temperature changes, the viscosity of that oil changes. Um, so those are all simplifications that we make. That, that hurt the accuracy but make the, the model easier to use. If we were to include more of these um, you know details uh, you could imagine so here we've got a, a block that's representing a motor 
and so maybe the mo that model you include the nonlinear friction, you include the, the time varying parameters, um, and then you start to couple it with other complicated models, uh, so the engine or the battery, etc. So you could imagine that at this level, um, this is a much more accurate model, but it it would be impossible to solve by hand. Um, the only way that we could solve it is to numerically approximate a solution to the equations and that is in in essence what simulation is so so that's a an alternative approach um, you can get better accuracy but it's maybe not as intuitive um, you can sort of do experiments on the system to see what the effects of various parameters are uh, change a parameter change the input um, and observe the output but you don't you don't have a closed form solution that explicitly shows the effect of each parameter. Looking at this for a second, can you think of any reason why you might not want to make the simulation model as detailed as possible? Is there any reason why you wouldn't want to include all, you know, the highest level of, um, of accuracy possible? Well, the reason that you wouldn't is because that it could make the it could make the simulation take a very long time to run. Uh, you could uh, imagine a situation where um, maybe it takes ten hours for the simulation to run one second of time, and so in that case, maybe the model is very accurate, but it's not very useful because it it takes so long to run different test cases.